First UN sponsored World Conference Against Racism held two decades ago in Durban, South Africa, was so rife with anti Israel bias, it's seen today as have been a key launching pad for BDS, the movement to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel. Well, the extent of that bias to some degree caught Israel and its supporters by surprise. But not so a follow up event being held this Wednesday at the UN General Assembly in New York, marking the 20th anniversary of the original Durban Conference. Well, this time around, though, at least 20 nations are skipping the event and others ground downgrading their participation, in part due to a vigorous campaign against it by Israel and some non-governmental organizations. Well, one of those is the International Legal Forum, and we're joined now by its chair and CEO, Austin Ostrowski. Great to have you, Austin. Thank you, Kevin. First of all, maybe a little background. Why that first Durban conference is today, even today, two decades later, seen as such a significant significant and certainly to some I would say infamous event. Look, I think infamous is correct. It's, it's such a jarring moment. I think the, the international community came together in Durban, South Africa in 2001 with great sense of hope and purpose and mission that they were coming together to fight the scourge of anti not just anti-Semitism but racism, xenophobia, discrimination. But what happened was it descended into unhinged display of sheer Jew hatred. It wasn't just hatred of Israel, it was Jew hatred, it was Holocaust distortion, it became the catalyst for the BDS movement, for the Israel's apartheid libel. Um, essentially what was meant to be a conference to fight racism became a conference to promote racism against one group of people and one only, the Jewish nation. Right. Israel, in fact, I believe, is the only nation mentioned in the uh, final statement by name uh, as testament. Now, we should mention there have been sort of follow-up conferences over the years, uh, and now we have this event coming uh, in October. Talk about, for example, how the Israeli government and how specifically your organization has been preparing mm. for this event. You know, there certainly have been follow-up conferences, and it's important to note, for example, in 2009 follow-up conference, none other than Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, spoke there. Dozens of countries walked out, but he spoke there right in front of Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations. So this whole process, this whole Durban process that started 20 years ago has been under the auspices and under the watchful eye and endorsement of the United Nations. Um, so they have given them the seal of approval. Um, but as you said, I think uh, 2001, it may have caught not just the Jewish community, but the but Israel and those supporters of Israel may be off guard. It certainly hasn't done so now because we know what to expect. We've seen the hatred. We've seen that. It, we've seen its effects. When you look at what's happening in the streets today across America, across Europe, this violence against Jews, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It is a direct result of this vilification of Israel, of this pervasive discourse and language that was born in 2001 in Durban. So a lot of organizations, ours, uh, the International Legal Forum, we have been trying to expose and underscore the anti-Semitic roots of Durban. We have been calling on nations, especially in Europe, especially in Europe, to not give any credence to this festival of hate, especially those countries, for example, that have adopted the IHRA, the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, definition of anti-Semitism, and that are yet to withdraw from this conference, the very epitome of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism for them to show that if they do mean that they are serious about fighting anti-Semitism, that they are serious about combating racial hatred, and that they do promote tolerance to say no to Durban 4. Right. Now, it had some results. I said there's some 20 countries, mainly Western European mm -hmm. nations, including the U.S., that are not participating. But, of course, many many others are, some that are openly hostile to Israel, but not all of them. And the argument you hear from them is, we understand we're going into the Durban conference with our eyes wide open, but better we're there and we engage with it rather than we uh, boycott it. What's your answer to that uh, approach? It's very simple. 20 principal nations, leading democracies, have said that they will not give any kind of legitimacy to this conference because they see very clearly with their eyes that it is tainted, it is, it is rotten to the core with anti-Semitism. So they will not legitimize it in any way. For those countries that are remaining, a number of them in Europe, for example, right. they have to ask themselves, are they aligning themselves with democracies, with liberal values, or are they aligning themselves with countries that are staying in this conference, such as Iran, such as North Korea, such as Cuba, Russia, China, and the Taliban with Afghanistan now, 
Which side of history do they want to be on? They right. have to ask themselves. Right. Now, you mentioned the work of your organization and other NGOs, and there's also going to be a counter uh, conference that day mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be organized by some other NGOs. And the uh, 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 Israeli ambassador uh, to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, will be speaking uh, there, or at least virtually. But what about Israel? You spoke about NGOs. Mm -hmm. Israel certainly, as a government, and it was very distracted, we should know, 20 years ago in the midst of the Second Intifada by what was going on here. Uh, how do you think the response has been by the Israeli government going into this? Look, I think they've taken it very seriously. Uh, we've worked closely with different elements of the Israeli government, and I've certainly seen firsthand that they are uh, taking this um, very seriously, that they are Essentially, it's a full court press uh, diplomacy, diplomatic outreach uh, to their embassy, to the pro Israel community, and to their counterparts, both in the foreign ministries around the world, as well as at the United Nations. Gilara Dunn, uh, Israel's ambassador, not just to the U.S., but to the U.N., who you said is speaking actually right, right now today at, this, at one of these conferences, have certainly led a, a very strong diplomatic push and uh, reaching out to colleagues uh, to not attend this conference and to side with those countries, the community of nations that are actually standing up against anti-Semitism, against racial hatred and for tolerance, the right. exact virtues, that, the exact values that this conference stands against. Now, we have to again note, this is a UN-sponsored conference, yeah. uh, which is why it uh, certainly initially in the follow-ups have gained some degree of international legitimacy, mm -hmm. despite the anti-Israel bias. Uh, again, a big argument between those who say we have to engage in the, U uh, 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 in the UN and some of the bodies, uh, for example, the Human Rights Council that have anti-Israel bias. The Biden administration has taken that approach. I mean, what's your feeling about that? I mean, what does this prove or not prove about the UN, the fact that this uh, summit is taking place? Look, this is the fourth such summit that's taking place. To those that have said and are saying that by staying in, we can affect change. Right, that is the approach, the argument. They Correct, but, but that, that's exactly what I'm saying, because this is the fourth such conference now that they're holding, celebrating 20 years and if they really can affect change, why have they not affected change? Why is Israel still the only, the only country that is singled out for a perbium? Well, okay, I guess that's uh, your argument there. And of course, we'll have to see what it actually comes out of that uh, mm -hmm. uh, event on Wednesday. Austin Ostrovsky of the International Legal Forum, thank you for joining us thank on you. the rundown. And moving on, he's become the voice of the Israeli Defense Forces to the Arab world. Lieutenant Colonel Avichai Adrei, the IDF spokesperson for Arab media. And now he is confronting many of Israel's harshest critics in the region directly on social media, including TikTok. Our Sammy Israel adapted this Channel 12 news profile of the engaging Adrei.